how did I get involved with Talk Talk in the first place? It was a strange coincidence in a way because I happened to know the manager of the band, Keith Aspton, originally. And I think he was had a bit of a dilemma because Mark Hollis certainly didn't want to be represented in the typical sort of style of the day, which generally speaking was sort of pretty boy photos on the front of album covers in the sort of style of Duran Duran, who were their kind of nemesis at the time. My name's James Marsh. I'm an artist, illustrator and uh, designer and sometimes author. That was the kind of main starting point for how not to to sort of illustrate them. And I think that's why he asked me, because I think he thought it'd be good, good to go down the illustration route. Yeah, I did start out as a designer. I ended up working for two record companies. When I moved to Decca Records, I had a lot of opportunities to do things that didn't exist. And that was a great vehicle for me, you know, as a young designer to experiment. So I did all kinds of stuff there. And that's what got me into illustration, actually. The fact that I started illustrating covers. I didn't have anything to go on actually, didn't even hear any music at the time. I just had the name Talk Talk. So I literally just went with the name. I thought I'd do something that represents the name, hence the lips. I did some sketches initially, quick drawings, just to show the idea. At the same time they wanted to bring out a single. So it lent itself to doing the facial features. So I used the eye for one single and the lips for another single. In fact, we've got the singles here. This was, this was the first single and this is the album cover. And that kind of set the scene in a way for, for further, further work for the whole project. In fact, I wanted to continue that through throughout. And in my mind, there was always, it was always kind of referring back, even with the color of spring, it had the facial features, sub subliminally placed amongst the moths. You know, I did have the brief that they wanted to do different things with it. One of the things was badges. That's a perfect example where it can just stand alone. I mean, it, it was thinking about it like branding. Yeah, exactly that. I think it would have been more consistent and more of a sort of continuation or continued sort of theme in a way if I'd have been left to my own devices. It's just that it transpired that the second album, which is It's My Life, due to the success, it, sort of, it was quite quickly successful, the first album, they decided to bring out another album on the back of the success. There wasn't time to do anything within the schedule. So I, I submitted ideas for, for this just based on the title. It's documented in the book, actually, The Spirit of Talk Talk, uh, how that came about. I'd done this book cover about a year previous and it was a similar theme to It's My Life and the, the image itself is based on The Boyhood of Raleigh by Millet. It's a well-known painting. I literally used small bits of it here. The boy and the mariner telling the story. It's like, that's the kind of gist of it. So he's telling his life story if you like or some sort of uh, seafaring tale anyway and the boys entranced by that so that it, the imagery suited it but I, I tried to imply other elements of of what was going on the record hence the puzzle pieces so I've always had a, a, a surrealistic influence I suppose since college days you know it was a big thing uh, in the 60s uh, you know people like Magritte were being used and Dali were being used in advertising so I, I think it just stems from that era I tend to be fairly ambiguous in what I do and I think that that kind of works in this context if it's not specific people can read things into it and people do anyway but it just works if the, if it's left if not everything's left spelt out. I used to do a lot of book covers for different authors. There was a period when people wanted to sort of be too, almost too literal about book covers, but I always thought there was no point in trying to sort of illustrate the whole book on the cover, because if you could do that, there wouldn't be any reason for reading the book. So you've got a hint at something that's there. And sometimes you just try and suggest a mood or a tone or a feel. All that comes into play, you know, it has to sort of hit the right note somehow. The feedback's been quite 
good in that respect from fans and critics, shall we say, that most people seem to th think that it does work very well. I can't imagine it being any other way, you know. Can't imagine the the albums being different to what they are. So that I suppose that speaks for itself, and that's a nice compliment. You do what I call a visual, which would be a small. I mean, it could even be a, just a thumbnail sketch. But if you had to show someone, then I'd probably sort of maybe work it up a bit better. I think I've got one or two examples. If you want to see something, here's one. This is rather more worked up than usual, but this is a what I would call a colour visual. It's just line drawing with magic markers to colour it in. Nowadays I tend to not do that. I tend to um, go straight to artwork. It's only really the final thing that is what you're trying to say. Doing a visual is just an idea. It doesn't really, in terms of the finish and the style and the quality, it doesn't really convey that. But that was the method of, of <laughs> you know, communication between the client and, uh, and myself. They were very, sort of took a back seat throughout the whole course of working for them. Reading between the lines, I think that worked for everybody because I just dealt with Keith. They trusted him to do what was right. But I mean, things did get back to Mark. He would have to sort of say yes or no, ultimately. But it, we were left pretty much to our own devices. Even the EMI were quite happy for Keith to take the reins on that. So we would just kind of work together. You know, he just told me what was happening next and I just went away and came up with the goods. And this is the first time actually I had some lyrics to work with. But normally I didn't have that. I don't think there was a particular theme except that I've always felt there's been a sort of environmental theme within Talk Talk's work. That sort of suited me quite well because I'm a bit of an environmentalist myself. So I've, and always interested in natural history. So I've always used the the sort of natural world as a sort of vehicle for my work in a way. The idea came to me when I was sitting in my studio. I had at the time a collection of moths in a entomological case. I just thought it'd be quite a good idea to have moths as a theme so I could use a collection of moths for the album and individual moths for the singles. It's a bit like, you know, your children, isn't it? You're not supposed to have favourites, are you? You're supposed to love them all. <laughs> But um, yeah, I think, I think my favourite has always been, despite that, Spirit of Eden. It's my favourite purely on a personal level because it was an image that done at a transition time in my life. I started getting feeling I wanted to do something different. Having set up a successful design studio, I decided to go solo. I did sort of think I was going to go into fine art. So I did a series of personal paintings with that in mind. And that was, that was one of the first ones I did. So it was, it was kind of a marker. So it didn't have a particular purpose, but it, now it does. I mean, it, a lot of things I tend to do on a personal level seem to find the home that they were meant to have. This is just another example of work that people might not associate with me. It's mixed media, I call it. I've used an old photograph as the basis for this. I do a lot of personal work, which is sort of gallery based, you might say, which is relief collage. So here's a couple of examples. That's the finished piece, which is just found collected bits and pieces, really. For me, it's an exercise in composition and shape and form. I play around, really. But this is, here's another one, which is just, again, more to do with composition. But it's just stuff found to create something new with. And there's another one here. It's pretty much finished. I just wanted to change the um, the frame on this. I'm going to put another inner slip. I just didn't like the colour. There's a couple of book samples. With these ones, it's a combination of experimenting with the illustration work and also writing. But some of these, which are experimental, have been used for um, album covers. That one's been used on a, a collage poster for a um, theme about tolerance, actually. Quite a worthwhile project that's traveling the world at the moment there's a thing with albums people remember certain times when they hear certain music and that i think that has a a resonance with people regardless of what the image is the two things are synonymous you know the music and the covers so it, it it's almost like an automatic thing that that becomes defining for that particular era the music or the you know the image itself there has been analogies drawn i've been called a visual frontman for talk talk but i mean that's as far as it goes really i mean there's um, ne i was never involved with the band 
very much at all, to be fair. But I'm, I'm, I'm happy that uh, people like the work and, and it's, it's sort of stood the test of time. There was a time when, um, when they disbanded that I was a bit disillusioned with the sort of interest and the re repetitiveness of people sort of wanting me to talk about talk talk. I, I accept it now. I don't sort of think, I don't want to talk about it. I don't do a mark, you know, and say I've said what I've said and that's the end of it. I've been grateful, if nothing else, for the fact that I've been asked to do a lot of work post talk talk from different bands that have been introduced to talk talk themselves and, and been aware of me via talk talk and have come to me for designing their album covers i've been lucky they don't ask me to do another talk talk cover they accept what i do and um let me think about it and come up with something that i think suitable for them and it's still going on today i mean i've got a couple of album covers in the pipeline now who are fans of talk talk and so the legend continues actually this will be a quite a good uh, segue into discussing typography because this is my t font yeah. designs here. It's a sort of uh, paperback version of the original uh, book by Ben Wardle, A Perfect Silence, which is this one. Here's the new cover, which again uses a shell as the motif. The first one was obviously referring to the title Silence, but there's a subliminal aspect to it. It's a sort of metaphor, I suppose, for um, Mark Hollis and himself being a sort of introverted type of character and shells by their very nature are completely insular. It's not intended to be derogative. It sort of goes against the sort of pop aspect which he was involved in. And I think he himself was really wanted to be clamped shut about a lot of things. So <laughs> there's all sorts of symbolic reasons for using it. This is um, an abalone shell, which, you know, obviously looks like an ear. They both are actual shells, but this is an inverted heart as well, which is a sort of symbolic reference as well to Mark, who had a love-hate relationship with a lot of things, particularly in the music industry. Did you spot the difference, by the way, on the two covers with the type? The W on Ben's name is, is different, using the alternate W in this particular case, as opposed to the default. Minor things, but it's just all part of the typography challenge, shall we say. So I'll find some imagery. The main font used on uh, the title, Mark Hollis, is Gallery 2. The other one used in conjunction is called Bodoni-esque. The main reason for using it was to go with the, with the musical note actually, not to have too much of a contrast between the, the look of it. I suppose it's a bit like w what I do generally, your personality maybe comes through, your way of thinking, your aesthetics all come through in whatever work you're doing and typography is no exception really. When I moved out of London, which is um, 2002. I didn't particularly want to get into computers but I realised at the time if I wanted to be self-sufficient I needed to get into the technology but it was more to do with you know with the service industry you had to go to a photographer to get stuff photographed a sort of type place to get type done and you know all kinds of different things and I realised that to be self-sufficient the computer could do that and so it's been great for the autonomy to me, it's just another tool. Being an artist is always quite insular, so it's, it's not really to do with the environment, really. It's just, I mean, I suppose it's to do with having a comfortable workspace. In many ways, I call this my ideal working environment. There are lots of work area, different workspaces. I've got a great view over the Hive Bay here, stretches out further to the French coastline. But that's kind of different thing to working, you know, when you're working, you'll kind of have your blinkers on almost. You know, you could think it's nice, it would, might be nice to live somewhere warm and have a different environment, but that's never appealed to me because I, I find if it's too hot, it's not conducive to working. I get up and I go to work and then I work all day and then I finish in the evening. For me, going to work, that's what I enjoy doing. 